You're listening to Parasearch Radio. News, views and reviews from the world of the paranormal from across the UK and beyond. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web. The views and opinions expressed by presenters and guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Parasearch Radio or their affiliates and sponsors. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Haunted Histories with your host, Penny G. Morgan, right here on Parasearch UK Radio. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Same thing I normally start my uh, show with. Wow, I've already got people in the chat room. Hi, Paul. Hi, Kerry. Good to see you guys. Well, I'm not going to not gonna talk for too long because I've got a good hour's worth of... Hi, Rich. I've got a good hour's worth of an interview for you tonight that um, I pre-recorded earlier today with my wonderful absolutely wonderful guest and Kerry you know in the live you said you were laying bets on how long we ended up talking for it was just under three hours and um yeah the only reason we we sort of decided we'd better go is that we were talking about having to get ready for things like school runs and everything else so uh yeah it was um it was an amazing it was a very good conversation but yes three hours three hours is how long we were talking for. But, uh, so what's everyone been up to? No, you weren't too far out, Kel. You weren't too far out at all. Um, it is a good, what, that I woke up for the show or that Kerry woke up for the show, Paul? I must admit, I'm looking forward to getting to my bed tonight. It's been a long old day. Long old day. But what's everyone been up to then? Uh, I'm, uh, off to Norfolk this weekend. I'm going to be at Gresson Hall Workhouse on Saturday night with the gorgeous Rosie and Stuart from Simply Ghost Nights and the rest of their amazing team. I'm really looking forward to it. You know how I love a good old workhouse and this will be my second investigation of Gresson Hall. Um, really looking forward to it. Really looking forward to it and I'll get to see my mummy and my daddy as well because uh, I've, uh, I've got, I get my bed for the night at their house. That's quite good isn't it? I don't have to worry about driving home from Norwich at three o'clock in the morning I get to sleep at my parents house literally just phone up and check the hotels free and I get to stay there it's quite useful but don't tell them I said that it's quite nice to see them as well and I'll be child free all weekend (laughs) yes oh there's bonuses everywhere isn't there well don't forget that I'm going to be at a Bodmin jail on the uh, 4th of October doing the paranormal conference that they're having paranormal event they're having there um yeah, we did. We did actually. We genuinely did discuss boobs, and it, Jane's not lying. We definitely did discuss boobs. Um, yeah, yeah. Walton on the Nays in Norfolk. Walton, what? I don't know what you're going on about there, Richard. Sorry. Anyway, um, what was I going to say? Yes, I'm going to be in Bodmin doing a presentation there, and the lovely Neil Packer's going to be there as well with me, and that's in a that's in a few weeks. So there's a lot going on, and we've got so many new pop new blogs and everything for you guys to read that are going up on the website let me know let me know what you think of them but without much further ado i'm not going to bore you and waffle on some might say that's a good thing some might say it never changes anyway no matter what i do i'm just going to play this a brilliant interview that i recorded earlier today well hello you know i like to bring you great guests and I, I think I say this every single week that I have been so looking forward to talking to my next guest. And I have. I have some amazing guests on. I really do. Well, this week's guest, which if you can't remember who's, whose name is in the title of the show, is a lady who, I, I think this is meant to be a compliment, I've been compared to on more than one occasion because of our, shall we say, mutual passion for something. And... Um, I look up to her and I like what she does and I, I read a lot of what she does and I've watched a lot of what she does and uh, and having just chatted to her for the last hour, my my regard for her has gone up even more. It is the wonderful lady from the black country, Mrs Jane Harris. How are you doing? Hi Penny. Oh my God, what an introduction. 
pressure's on <laughs> everyone says that every week I do my introductions and they go how do I follow that no, just follow it <laughs> follow it being your awesome self it's fine <laughs> bless you thank you for inviting me on I've been really looking forward to it as well and you know you mentioned that you admire my work well I admire yours you know a lot of your books and stuff I, I just think you're fantastic so I, I've really been looking forward to it oh, as well you. You. I'll tell you what we should team up sometime we'd be a force to be reckoned with oh I know His, historical historical oh I don't know I'll think of something good mm, we should His, we should team up and do something the, his, the history mystery sisters well that's oh, a bit of a mouth. yeah <laughs> I think I think I think we'd stop everyone in their tracks. I think I think between the two of us we could do something special. Yeah, join forces. Mm. Mm. I'm, I'm, my mind's going now. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you ever so much for coming on the show. Like I say, it's, what, it's one I've definitely been looking forward to because your passion for history is is on a par with mine. Um, and, and are we allowed to tell this little story you were telling me beforehand of some of the research you were doing for your new series of Help My House is Haunted? Yes, yeah, of course. The census story. Ah, OK. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of what I do, history was probably my first passion, to be honest with you. So at school, I, the, the thing that captivated me the most was when we did the Tudors and the Stuarts. Mm -hmm. So instantly, as soon as we did that in school, I was about, I don't know, probably about eight or nine, I suppose, when we first heard about Henry VIII and everything. I, I was just hooked, absolutely fascinated. And ever since then, I've almost felt, I don't know that I'm, I'm living at the wrong time because I became mm. so infatuated with the past yeah. that that it just intrigued me constantly and everything I do, you know, from, from the food I eat to the music I listen to, it, it's all kind of influenced and I see that coming through and I'm lucky actually that I met my husband and he's very similar because I think I'd, I'd spoil another couple to be honest with you with just my kind of interest in the past and history and so I think you know as growing up I just wanted to know as much as I possibly could about why we are who we are and that mm -hmm. encroached into learning about psychology as well but more about what makes society tick and where where do our decisions come from and all of that and really you have to look at history for that mm -hmm. now when I became interested in the paranormal it kind of as we were saying before you know that they're one and the same almost I don't think personally that you can have an interest in the paranormal without understanding and being passionate about history because mm -hmm. where do ghosts come from the past mm -hmm. so going back to the story I was telling you earlier um when I was asked whether I'd like to be part of Help My House is Haunted um I'll be honest I hadn't seen any of series one and so my, my first comment really was well can I have a couple of days let me watch a few episodes and just kind of get a feel for it and, and see because the last thing I wanted was to be involved in something that was you know a scream fest or just didn't mm. sit well with me so you know I, I didn't want to kind of be awkward about it but you know I, I said I, I'm not I can't say yes straight away I just want to know a bit more about it so um I watched one episode I watched about half an hour and I just knew instantly that you know I was happy to be involved in it because I, I liked the style, I liked the feel of it, I liked Barry and Chris, I thought they were brilliant they're great, so, aren't they? yeah, they really are and so that was that and then over the course of a few weeks I watched the entire first series um, but one of the conversations I had quite early on with um, one of the producers there was about my role in the show because um, I was very keen, you know, I, I said what exactly are you looking for you know I knew that Sandy had been offered work in Paris where mm. she lives and that she'd accepted that so that was why she wasn't part of series two um but I wanted to know what they actually wanted from me did they want me to be a Sandy replacement because I had to kind of be honest and say look I don't do some of the things that I've seen Sandy do in series one you know I don't do the the more mystical stuff the, yeah. the cleansings and all mm. that kind of thing this is what I do and I talk mainly about research. Um, I said, look, I look into a property, I look into the land, I look into the people who may have lived there. Um, and I try really to find a logical explanation for what's going on. And sometimes that logical explanation doesn't mean that I'm telling people 
their house isn't haunted, sometimes the logical explanation is it is haunted. It's giving them corroboration. Yeah, you're giving them corroboration for what they're finding out, yeah. That's it. So, um, so they said, well, well, talk us through what, you know, what do you do? How do you do your research? So, you know, I started explaining about, you know, the census and that you can find so much now online, parish records, deaths, burials, marriages, births. And uh, we, we were talking about this and I gave him an example of a case that I'd worked on where I found out the names of all the family members who lived in the house over the past hundred years and things that people were experiencing there now, why they were experiencing it. And... Um, the producer was fascinated and he said so go this this searching for people then this sense of how do you do that then and and i thought wow okay um i look at you know and i just went on to talk about the census and how much information is on there the fact that you can find out people's professions and yep. and and all sorts of relevant information um so yeah straight away they decided they wanted to sort of weave that into um into part of what I was doing, you know, bring that on board with the team. So I was pleased about that um, because I think far too often we see groups and teams going out there and investigating places that they know nothing about. Yeah. So, you know, that they're going armed with other people's experiences and presumptions, but they don't actually know, you know, as we were saying before, you can be told that the ghost of a lady called Mary who hung herself in the bedroom haunts the hotel. But what if no one called Mary ever worked there lived there stayed there you, you know so i think really to understand any alleged haunting you've got to do a bit of historical research because you've got to have a foundation for, yep. for anything that might happen yeah so that's a long-winded answer but no, no but, <laughs> but i mean you do know you're, have... you're preaching to the converted here because i'm yeah. sitting here nodding my head in agreement the whole time because it's 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 it is amazing you pop into the records office and I know people who know me know that when I go to Essex records office it's like going to a sweet shop for me because the amount of information is that's literally at the end of your fingertips that you can find but it's I, I, I to me it's at least have one person on the team that knows that so you know you know you go into a house and everyone says oh yes it was built in the 1950s but what you find out it was actually built in the 1930s that's quite a major difference so that for example means the house saw the second world war mm-hmm. well there's triggers you can use you know, there, there's, there's, there's no point playing to someone whose house was built in the 1950s, say 1920s music, because it's not going to mean anything. It, it's, it's those kind of um, Kelvin and Hatch. I have had so many rows with my father-in-law about when that was built, even though I've proved to him when it was built. He still maintains it was built in the Second World War, and I'm like, no, it was built after the Second World War. It was built in like 1951 or something. And and it's like just knowing these facts, even if even if you don't tell the, the medium the facts, because the psychic medium likes to sometimes you can validate what they're telling you. So when they when you know when one of them says I'm seeing um, you know some I can't even think even who the prime minister would have been in 1951, but say they said I'm seeing the prime minister, and you're like, well that was the prime minister in 1951. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know you can you can kind of validate what they're telling you, but to me it's a no brainer absolute yeah. no-brainer it, it's a shame that i mean during this series each episode is sort of 45 minutes long mm-hmm. so we filmed for three days at each location so there's so much that that won't make it into each episode and we've yeah. seen what we call the rough cuts of each episode now so i i know what's in there and what isn't and there are a couple of episodes where it's a real shame where you think oh no that was so interesting and so mm-hmm. fascinating but you know you you can't fit you just physically can't fit everything in. but there was one location we went to and um, when chris arrived he said that he was seeing it was a normal cottage um with a driveway nothing you know to give away what it used to be um but he was seeing horses um and then he mentioned a cart outside and i knew um and he said about cows in the field and that he could see someone in a small building selling things well i knew that it was a former dairy and that they used to make the butter and they used to sell it from a building which isn't there anymore which was outside the front of the cottage uh-huh. and the horse and cart would have been directly where we were stood when he was picking up on all of this so i was just you know blown away because for one i know that chris does not know where he's going i mean he doesn't even know which, which day we're leaving which hotel we tell him <laughs> sort of there and then it's like oh we're moving okay um, so he doesn't know where he's going. We have to tell him on the approach, right? We're nearly there. Are you picking up on anything yet? Um, so it was just amazing. And that happened several times where yeah. 
he was seeing things or you know sensing things and I knew but I couldn't say at that point because we have to wait till he's done his whole walk around Mm -hmm. I knew that he was picking up on echoes of the past from that place and so it, it was just fascinating yeah but now I'm with you on the history side and to be honest mm. most groups I am the history person who does all the research beforehand and can't research everything though that's the only thing and someone will find would someone called such and such have lived here well this has been here 400 years can I check that one for you <laughs> I haven't yeah. memorised everyone who lived here right now but it's, it is interesting and then you start digging in I mean, it's, it's like the piece I wrote recently on Coombe Abbey when you start digging into a place's history and I know you and I are going to be doing um Ettingham next year aren't we I'm coming yeah, to your event fun. so I will be mm-hmm. digging into that place as well beforehand but it's fascinating what you can find out and I do get quite excited when you know who would have thought Coom Abbey was involved in the gunpowder plot I mean, who would have thought it I know Seriously. there is there are so many buildings across the Midlands that that were part of that there's one called Holbeach House which you've probably heard of I have yeah. um that it featured in the drama that they did um, recently it, the actual house didn't feature in it it's a care home now mm. but um, th- they replicated it but the care home was where my grandmother stayed for a right. while um, and when you're in the main reception area there are still bullet holes in the walls which they've left you know for kind of historical interest from that for, and it, it's just amazing and you see in the dining room they've left um, there was a priest hole and they've just left it exposed with a glass panel and just those little things I yeah. just remember thinking wow I never thought I'd like a care home but this place is amazing you know it's, oh, it, it was just them. it was just speaking you know yeah. it, it was all there um, but yeah there, there's lots yeah. you know Robert Catesby riding his horse across the fields of Warwickshire and heading from Coton Court to Holbeach House and, and all of these bills I mean they don't all advertise the fact that they were involved in the gunpowder plot no. but uh, well, I think no, at Coombe Abbey, it, it was Coombe Abbey Princess Elizabeth was staying at and they'd planned to kidnap her to turn her into a Catholic puppet and the chap whose house it was got wind of it and so came back from the hunting trip that he'd been on to stop them. And it's yeah. just little things like that. You just you just think, wow. And Well, I get excited about that sort of thing and fortunately, you're mentioning that your husband is a history fan, so is mine. And um, I always tell this story because it makes makes me laugh. Is I think it was our wedding anniversary, and uh, we always try and do something on our wedding anniversary. Not like necessarily just go out for dinner or whatever, but something a bit different. And I think my eldest would have been about two, my eldest son, so I didn't have the younger one. And my husband's like, "What should we do for the day?" And I said, "Tell you what, let's go to Duxford Air Museum. I haven't been there since I was a kid. Love aviation. Obviously, big World War One, World War Two historian." And he was like, "Yeah, it's a really good idea. We'll make a day of it. It's about." an hour and a bit from where we live anyway he was telling one of his friends um, they said what are you doing for your anniversary mate he goes oh we're going to Duxford Air Museum for the day and his friend said you could have done something Penny wanted to do and he went that is what Penny wanted to do and they're like wow your wife wants to go to an aeroplane muse- military <laughs> museum for a year and, and he, they're like you're so lucky I'm like, yeah. yeah, it's fascinating. Of course, I would. Like when we went to France, we went because we wanted to see the D-Day beaches, so I could go to the. We could go to the museums and stuff. You know, some people think, well, it's not really fair, Wayne dragging you all the way over there to go over to military stuff. No, no, we both want to do it. It's not just, you know, my perfect day out in London would probably be somewhere like the Imperial War Museum, then somewhere for lunch, then Churchill's War Rooms. <laughs> you know, that would be my perfect day out. So. Yeah, it's it's useful. It is good when you find someone who's got similar. Um, yeah, that interests. you can you can yeah definitely indulge your you know indulge your interests. Mm. It it is. I mean, like I say, I'd, I'd probably spoil a normal couple. You know, so. Yeah. If I... <laughs> yeah, this is the first one I've been in that I I can actually indulge my infatuation for history without them sort of tapping their watch and going, "Are you finished yet?" Yeah, but one thing he hasn't done, my husband, which we're hoping to to sort out at some point, is been to Edinburgh. He has never been to Edinburgh. Now, well, that's that my neat little nice. segue into our. <laughs> I was going to say that brings us. Are nice you impressed? Are you impressed? Very good. <laughs> I was, that's just off the cuff. I just thought of that. I thought I was quite. Uh, yeah, you can tell I've been doing this for a, for a while, can't you? Seamless segue into what our show's about, Edinburgh. 
Why do you love Edinburgh so much, Jane? Oh, it's one of those places that the first time I went there, I just felt so comfortable, so at home. I mean, it's a big city, and mm-hmm. for someone like me who lives out in the sticks in the middle of nowhere, it's probably the last place you would expect me to want to go to or feel comfortable at. But the first time we went, we didn't have the kids, so it was just myself and my husband, um, and we spent a week in Edinburgh on Candlemaker Row, which is a beautiful, quaint little street just off Greyfriars Churchyard, or Kirkyard. Um, and the little flat we were staying in, when, when I walked in, I walked into the kitchen, and the kitchen window, I looked out, and I was actually halfway sunken within the graveyard, because the way the street works, you're kind of at eye level with the tombstones. It's difficult yeah. to explain, but <laughs> it was... And I was just you know exactly wow I just thought this is amazing so because of that I just wanted to know more about where's that what's that graveyard you know I need to go there I need to know more about that and some of the stones are just incredible you know it's like a Christopher Lee film set it's just Mm -hmm. remarkable um and so we walked around and then we went on some tours and we went down the the Royal Mile and Mary King's Close and the longer I was there I just didn't want to leave and I've been back several times since um I've been on my own for work things and we've been as a couple as well and it just does not lose its magic I love the castle I love just everything about it it's got a real strong identity it's it's obviously a big tourism hot spot but it's still Edinburgh and it's still old Edinburgh and you can still see echoes of its past everywhere and I think that's what I love about it you know you just you can completely get lost in the history you know you look around you the alleyways the cobbled streets the buildings it's just all there um so yeah I absolutely love it it's my favorite haunted location I it's quite a big one I can't choose any particular spot um as a favorite but I've got several you know that I I could go to again and again and never be bored well we've chosen two bit parts of it to talk about today haven't we because I had to narrow it down a bit because you gave me a big long list of places we could talk about and I was like right let's talk about these two which I'm going to say which ones we're going to talk about in a minute but I, I, I know what you, I know what you mean about Edinburgh I mean I feel like that about York that's how I feel about yeah. York as a, as a, as a city because I've been, probably been there more than I've only been I've been to Edinburgh a few times um, but Edinburgh as a place is quite interesting in that it, it's never it was never really an industrial hub or um, uh, or a hub of it, it, it was it was just one street for a very long time and and gradually I think it was to do with they said it was to do with the shipbuilding at Leith that it started to grow yeah. Um, yeah. and it kind of lost its sort of importance in Scotland to Glasgow a bit as time time progressed but it, it it was after the sort of shipbuilding industry in Leith took off that it started to really really expand and and you mentioned Mary King's well one of, I did a show on that a good few years ago but one of the things I found interesting was that until really the two bridges the north and south bridge were built everyone was equal regardless of whether you were upper middle or lower class you know you would live in the same block albeit the lower classes lived ha- lower than the upper class is hence upper middle lower and and it was only really once the sort of the victorian era hit uh, sort of so like the very very well obviously the 18th 1800s but the late 1700s early 1800s is when there started to be a lot more uh, class differences and and people lived in certain areas who was you know the areas started to segment a little more which is quite is quite an int- i think personally is quite interesting but as it as it got bigger, I think it was the late 18th century, they decided they needed to build two new bridges. And they built the North Bridge first, I believe it was. And then they built the South Bridge. Um, and it was under, under the South Bridge that the first thing that we're going to talk about kind of got constructed as a result of the bridge being built. And that's the Edinburgh Vaults that most people have yeah. probably heard of. Um, but do you know why Edinburgh is called Edinburgh? Now, I don't know that. Do you know that? I do know that. Oh, tell me. <laughs> it means the Fort of Iden. It was originally a fort town. And Burr means fort. And it was the Fort of Iden. Well, I didn't know that. I've learned something, Penny. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I've taught Jane Harris something. <laughs> I quite like that, well, in fact. Do, did you, do you know that the South Bridge is apparently cursed? 
I do. Would you like me to tell you about the curse? <laughs> Go on, tell me more. I do know about the curse. Yes, I actually tried to find some newspaper articles about it from back in the day, but I couldn't actually find any. Um, yes, well, locals believe the bridge was cursed because just before it opened in 1788, they had wanted... Well, some say it was the judge, wife of a judge, some of the things yes. I've read, and some say it was the oldest woman in Edinburgh one or the yeah. other was going to cross it as being maybe first, she was both maybe she could have been both <laughs> yeah she was due to cross it as the first person to cross it to kind of bless it and give it luck and everything else well she died a few days before it opened and they still took her across albeit in a hearse in a coffin in a hearse and that's why the locals believe it's cursed isn't that correct that's right that that it well that's what I've heard yeah. yeah and there are apparently some locals who won't cross the South Bridge I don't know if I believe that because they're making life very difficult for themselves if that's the case um, but yeah so it's apparently some locals will not cross the South Bridge because of the curse because yeah. it's considered unlucky that the first thing across there was a dead body mm-hmm. yeah yeah, I thought that was, and the fact that the person who was supposed to do it died just beforehand and then got taken across as a dead body. I, I think yeah. that's quite. I mean, it, it's it's plausible. I can understand why. I did find an article saying about something about the person who was due to unfortunately passed away beforehand, but I was looking for one that actually said when it opened because I found some saying it was early April, and others saying it was June July time it meant to have opened, and I was trying to find something that definitely said it. But newspaper articles from the late seventeen hundreds aren't as easy to find as 100 years later unfortunately i do love i do love looking for old newspaper articles though on the uh, oh yeah when when you find one as well we um we found something out for one of the episodes we were in a village i I won't name it or anything like that but we were we were there and apparently there'd been um a stabbing so there'd been an old woman who went insane for for whatever reason she attempted to murder her husband and she was imprisoned for that but she was let out after about two years and they got back together um because she stabbed him tried to Mm -hmm. kill him so they got back together and then not long after she actually stabbed a young boy a schoolboy, while he was walking to school stabbed him in the neck and killed him in the street a completely random act um but this was a kind of local legend a local rumor and we thought well you know don't know how plausible this is well when i looked into the newspaper archives it was there and it was horrific she she severed she actually severed his head more or less she almost took his head off with with wow um, that's with not a knife, easy with a knife in the neck um and apparently before that she'd been arrested for attempting to throw another schoolboy off a bridge um so you know she, she was obviously insane but um, just to see it there in black and white in print from the time, I think it was from about 19, mm, I want to say 18, 1919. Um, but I just couldn't believe it. And it, it kind of tied so many things together. Wow. But um, yes, good old newspaper archives. Yeah, they it. are very helpful. They are very, very helpful for stuff like that. And although sometimes with journalists, you do have to sort of take it with a pinch of salt when it validates something else that you find or at least adds to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, I said I couldn't. I found what I did find though about the bridge was after it opened, they used the kind of the viaduct space, didn't they, as shops and um, for trading yeah. and all that kind of thing. And I found an awful lot of adverts to do with shop space for for rent or shops having events on or all those. I also found one about a shop that there was a fire that destroyed the whole shop, um, and they attributed that to the curse. I found that as well. Um, not the the fact that someone probably had an open fire or a candle that fell over and set fire to things that were highly flammable. <laughs> it was it was of the course. curse. Um, but what they also discovered was when they built these, because obviously the, the the foundations, and I'm teaching you to suck eggs here, Jane. This is more for people listening. Um, the foundations was obviously had to gone underground. They discovered they had kind of subterranean spaces in mm. these, I suppose, viaduct arches, for want of a better term. And that's what we now know as the vaults, isn't it? Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, there were businesses under there. And I mean, I didn't realise that. The first time I went, we went down into the vaults. And, and I thought that's exactly what they were. You know, the kind of storage for the buildings above. But no, you know, people lived there, worked there. Mm. Quite incredible. I mean, everything yeah. you ever imagined about a grim existence you know during the late medieval and, and into the 17th century during that period you know it was real there yeah. it, it happened but 100 <laughs> years on 
a hundred yeah, years. Well, yeah, it was yeah. the eighteen hundreds, mid eighteen hundreds. They think that they they're not sure when it was. They they say it was between sort of about eighteen ten to about eighteen seventy, roughly. They think, but it was only discovered about twenty years ago that people had lived down there, wasn't it? Yeah, they found things, didn't they, when they were doing work down there? They found just signs of, of life, children's, you know, little, little sort of toys that they'd made themselves yeah. and stuff. Yeah, and food bowls um, and all that kind of thing. And it was actually a, um, I have to say, it's, it's a rugby player. A up the rugby players, much better than football. It was a Scottish rugby player called Norrie Ro- Rowan who found it, found the entrances to the vault and started excavating them with his son to find out what was down there. Which you know, you think you'd think that it would be on like I don't know some kind of council records or something. They would have known it was there, but nobody did. It was it was it was all a big sort of like we didn't. You know, it was relative. I'm sure it was about 1989, 1990, around that time that he, or maybe just before, but it was certainly in very much in living memory that he discovered them and they started yeah. looking into it and they found, as you say, like children's toys and. And evident, um, like tools and evidence that people were living down there before, I suppose, the local authorities cleared them out and bricked it up, which yeah. is amazing. Yeah, well, you think, you know, if if you think of a child who's born down there and then spends, oh. you know, if, if they live past sort of about four or five, that you know, that, then they spend their childhood down there. and. Mm. That has to have an effect, doesn't it? You know, a psychological effect, an emotional effect, a physical effect. Vitamin, you know, imagine, vitamin D and all that kind yeah. of thing, yeah. Um, and you just imagine the conditions, you know, saying this before about obviously no sewerage, no drainage. You literally right. throw your human waste out into the walkway and it makes its way to the edges. And, you know, people just carry on walking around and working and living around it. I mean, the rats and the disease and it, it would just be unimaginable for people today, but um yeah that's why they say that they're they're so active they're so haunted because all of that heightened energy and emotion is down there you know but yeah. i don't know whether there would have particularly be i mean compared to our lives today that's hot you know certainly would seem that it would be heightened emotion but these people didn't really know any different you know no. it, the children would have just played running in and out of, of the different chambers and and whatever and you know that that was just life you know i think yeah. hu- human beings are very resilient aren't we and, it, and you kind of i mean look at the war yeah. you know what people had to do lives changed literally overnight yeah. and yet people just get on with it you know it doesn't yeah. you you don't die from having to live a hard life you you just learn from it and you get on with it and um sadly of course because of the vaults the the time period we're talking about the the deprivation and the disease and the crime and everything else there would have been lots of deaths down there you know people would have been robbed if they had the the smallest thing you know an heirloom something that they'd inherited or even a few coins anything you know these were desperate people yeah um and they also believe that the 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 reason they stopped using the vaults for storage for the shops above was because it kept flooding so you've got people living down there in an area that's subterranean is next to a river is it's going to be flooding and full of um waste products mm-hmm. for want of a better term um no, shit <laughs> yeah. it's shit um and so that's going to be getting washed around when the waters rose you've got people running um if you like uh backhanding businesses down there so you have got people still trying to to earn a bit of money who are working down there and i think there was cobbler's tools had been found Mm -hmm. it was a well-known red light district as well so you would have had prostitutes down there i know there's talk of there being a very nasty um pimp who was based down there supposedly whether that's true or not i don't know but if there's prostitutes there probably is going to be a pimp um, it was a slum area anyway and as you say these people you know humans are pretty darned resilient but uh, whether I don't know whether the hauntings down there would be due to due to the fact they were deaths but could it have been due to the fact more some of the people down there would have been I say if it's true about the pimp who was down there they would have been people on possibly the less um, salubrious side of nature down there taking advantage yeah well I, I think like most places what the vault is probably dealing with is um both you know like you get your residual energy so you've got all of that from all of the people who live there all of the, all of the horrible things that must have happened mm. but i think quite possibly that there are 
spirits down there as well souls of people who did die you know untimely deaths um children i imagine as well you know there are people who've been down there and they've said that they've heard children's laughter or children crying and they've heard hushed voices and things so uh, i think that a lot of it will simply be kind of imprinted you know and at the right time the right person goes down there they can pick up on it and, and hear it and know know what happened you know an echo but yeah. um I I think as well, especially like you say, with some of the characters that would have been down there, um, you know, gambling, there was an illegal whiskey distillery down there. So, you know, people would have been drunk a lot of the time who were kind of involved with that. Um, yes, it doesn't make for good energy, does it? It doesn't make for a, a comfortable place yeah. to be. And, and I think people today pick up on that just as much as then. But do you think, okay, do you think that people automatically assume it's got to be negative down there because of the kind of place it is? Yes, I think that anyway, I mean, actually, if you if you go on any of the Edinburgh ghost walks, they very much come from the position of, you know, this is this is hell's house. Yeah. This is as, as black as the devil's heart kind of thing. That's mm-hmm. one of the, the sort of slogans on one of the websites. And it, it, yeah, because, you know, you're subterranean it's seen as you know any energies that down there are demonic you know there's got yes. to be something demonic down here because we're underground it wants to hurt you yeah mm. yeah so i mean there may well be we don't know but you know, realistically you're no closer to hell under there than you are on the ground you're literally mm. talking about 20 feet yeah. at most so, but yeah. you know I, I can see that it would have been a place where people would have practiced things that they wouldn't necessarily have practiced out in the open so for that reason there may have been something a bit darker stirred up we don't know um but there's the the witch's temple area down there isn't there where a a group a coven apparently used to practice rituals but anyone who knows anything about witchcraft knows that you know it's not about devil worship Uh, these people just wanted a private place to go you know it's like anything else it's the same reason why a group of witches may go into woodlands or you know may go out into the fields where they can't be seen it's yeah. privacy yeah yeah i mean as um, i say i told you the experience i had when i was in the vaults and and i i'd got we're talking about 17 18 years ago and and i'd gone on one of the tours with a friend of mine who was very skeptical and very sort of you know black is black white is white no in between kind of person and um, we were sort of straggling around at the back of the group because I was sort of looking at the walls and taking it all in as you do and and the guide kept saying you know if you're stuck at the back you'll something will happen it always does and and I felt someone put their hand on sort of touched me on the shoulder and I can't remember whether they sort of breathed at, in me ear or whispered something it was kind of one of the almost both if that makes sense yeah and I sort of went oh and jumped to turn around thinking there was another guide there sort of saying telling me to move on and there was no one there and 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 I'd asked my friend was there someone behind us and she went no there's no one there and when I told the guide afterwards he went that always happens to the stragglers but (laughs) it didn't feel like someone was going to do something bad to me it felt more like someone was it was almost like someone putting their hand on the shelf to say go on hurry up catch your group you know it's they're leaving without you sort of thing it wasn't a I say maternal. It wasn't maternal in that respect, but it wasn't intimidating. Um, hmm. And it definitely it, it felt enough like a hand on my shoulder for me to jump and turn around, thinking someone would put their hand on my shoulder from behind me. So I didn't find the only thing I found in there was it was a little. It felt a bit claustrophobic, but no more so than I say the the the. the um, cave air raid system in Malta say that I visited no more claustrophobic than that but as you you know you can imagine what it had the smell and the smoke and from people burning candles or um you say going to the toilet or just general body odor and I mean the, the, the things like cholera and typhoid typhus and all that must have been mm. rife yeah it it just would not have been but then I think the whole of Edinburgh you know I mean we see it now and what remains in to a large extent are the nice buildings Mm. but of course all of those buildings on the royal mile in particular you know they used to be sort of 10 11 stories high it was it was wood the rest wasn't it you know and you Mm. think that's it it was so overpopulated and as you say you know there were only literally one two streets in the castle um but tens of thousands of people and when they couldn't build any higher they had to go underneath and that's yes. when they started building below and you, if you just Im- you know imagine that as you were saying before it wouldn't really matter if you were wealthy or you were poor you wouldn't have been living a very good lifestyle in edinburgh because no. it 
it was just so overcrowded um sanitation would have been awful people were throwing it out in the streets above yep. ground so you know um it, it certainly wouldn't have been a nice place to be but then having said that you know people who lived out in rural parts wouldn't have really had it any easier you know they'd have no. had some fresh air um but but that that's kind of where it ended because the poverty and the lack of food but people survived of course yeah. um you know you you kind of adapt and get used to it but i can completely understand why the vaults are considered one of the most haunted places in edinburgh whether they are or not i don't know um i had an unusual experience down there with a photograph okay uh, which one of the areas and i can't remember what i don't think it's the witch's temple it's another little area down there but there is a circle of stones on the floor and the guide told us you know now don't step in the circle it's cursed something horrible happens to everyone who steps in the circle so my husband being how he is he stepped in the circle of course um <laughs> to date nothing horrible has happened although actually he wasn't my husband at that point so maybe it was marrying me maybe, maybe yeah was maybe that was his, his <laughs> punishment yeah. <laughs> yeah but i was taking photographs in there i took loads all around the place um and I took several of this circle um, and there was nothing in any of them at all. And then just for a laugh, I said, you know, OK, on the count of three, I'd like an orb to manifest, you know. And anyone who knows me knows how I, I always take orbs with a pinch of salt and I'm a bit kind of, you know, jokey about them. I said, all right, show me an orb. But actually, this has happened on two occasions now. The, the first occasion was in the vaults. And on the moment I asked for an orb, I took a photograph and in the centre is an orb, a pure, well, actually it's golden. Um, it definitely seems to be emitting light. It's completely round. You can zoom in and it's not an insect. Um, now, I'm not saying it's anything paranormal, but it was very coincidental how I'd taken probably six or seven other photographs with absolutely nothing in. And at the moment I asked for an orb, there appears an orb in the photograph i didn't see anything with my own eyes of course but um so that was quite interesting and i, I kind of ran over to my husband look at this look at this and he's like yeah it's dust I'm like, well yeah it might be but it might not be because you know and kind of explained to him what had happened and he, even he and he, he you know he's very kind of rational minded and doesn't really kind of buy into anything unless it happens to him and it's very evident that something unusual has happened he's just very kind of logical and no yeah, it's i've got one of them i've got one of them yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah infuriating isn't it yeah did you hear that bang yeah well do you know what it was oh, it's probably someone outside there is no one outside we're about two miles away from the nearest people oh it's probably nothing it's probably just the heating there isn't any heating <laughs> yeah yeah one of them yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but but even here you have to hear he's like oh, well yeah you know that that is a bit strange so um yes i did get a great orb photograph down there but, but that's the thing about orbs right and i have had this argument with people that i'm not a big believer in them however you cannot prove unequivocally that 100 percent of orb photos or orb experiences are dust water insects you can't prove it not unequivocally probably find mm. that 0.01 percent are something unexplainable and and i mean you you've shared that story i'll sh share the one that i had at kelverton hatch in that i was snuggling i'd had a i'd had this chap come through talking to me on a spirit board and he he was flirting with me and everything else it was quite nice you know he said he was 22 hey ho someone half my age you know i'm not going to say <laughs> no and anyway and one of the good girls has said oh penny's sleeping here tonight you can follow her if you want and i was like oh cheers you know thanks for that just joking around i was snuggling into my sleeping bag and it was kerry from fright nights london she took a couple of photos of me as i'm snuggled in and she took two or three in close you know like one two three like close succession and she mm. looked at one she went oh this is weird it looks like you've got a glowing orb in front of you and i was like oh it's probably just a reflection off the sleeping bag it's 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 my husband's sleeping bag he uses for fishing because we couldn't find mine and i just wanted one for the night and I said, I'm sure that's what it was. I don't know why it only showed up in one of the three, but I'm sure that's what it was. But then as I rolled over to go to sleep, literally minutes after this had happened, I felt someone grab my arm. Oh. And it oh. wasn't Kerry. She was too far away from me. There was nobody else around. And that happened literally within minutes of us seeing this light on the front of my sleeping bag. So whilst I think it possibly is dust from the sleeping bag or just a reflection of a I suppose like a mark on the sleeping bag my arm got grabbed within minutes afterwards 
Yeah. So you can't and it, say. That, that's the thing. No, I mean, it, that's the thing. If you're randomly just taking photographs somewhere, and I've done this, you know, I took loads of pictures in Greyfriars Churchyard, and it was raining, and every picture was full of orbs, you know, in inverted commas, yeah. uh, orbs. But, um, and they were rain. But that's not to say that every single orb photograph out there is rain or dust no. or insects, you know. We, we can't say. And that that's the thing, you know, I... Uh, everyone's got their own opinion on everything you know and i have as well of course yes. and that's that's brilliant as long as you keep an open mind and yes. are open to the possibility that maybe you're incorrect then then you know happy days everyone's fine and, and everything can carry on because i think the problem comes when you get people who are so steadfast in what they believe is correct yeah. and this this is anything you know the paranormal yeah. or anything that that's when you get problems that's when you get clashes that's when you get arguments we call them debates but they're not really they're they're kind of i'm right no i'm right no you're wrong and you never get anywhere you know there's so much energy wasted especially in the paranormal field on people just desperately trying to beat home their beliefs and and kind of knock down people who don't believe the same thing yeah that it's just wasted energy yeah. and you know I'm happy to say, you know, I don't believe most orb photographs are paranormal. However, I, I could be completely wrong. And I think that there's every chance that some of those pictures out there are something quite unexplainable. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, I think going back to Edinburgh, um, there, there are so many locations around there that are just hot spots, hot beds for, for, uh, for activity. If I lived there, I don't think I'd do anything else. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, I'd, I'd just be like, I'd be convinced that this is the place where I'm going to capture, you know, the amazing ghost photograph that convinces me that yes, it, it, you know, there are ghosts, there are. Spirits. I mean, convinces your husband? Oh no, nothing convinces my husband. No, oh, okay. <laughs> no it probably would if it was good enough. That would be the Holy Grail, did. wouldn't it? A photo that actually convinced our husbands yeah. about it. Yes, yes, yeah. Maybe but that's course, a goal for us. You know, that in the uh, in this day and age of Photoshop and all the rest of it, it's um, yeah. it's one of those things where what what constitutes proof? You know, for one person that's enough, and for another person it's not. So, yeah. which talking about sort of disagreeing with what people believe or having a healthy debate brings us on to our second place we're going to talk about, mm-hmm. and that's Greyfriars. I can't even speak now. Greyfriars, and specifically. Uh, the Black Mausoleum and um, the Mackenzie Poltergeist. Yes. Now, I started, I went off on a bit of a rabbit hole Warren type thing when I started looking into this one because the chap who is meant to be the Mackenzie Poltergeist, Mr. Well, Sir George Mackenzie of Rosehoff or Rosehow, I don't know how you pronounce it, he's, he's an interesting man. He, um, do you know much about him, his background? Not a great deal. I know mm. that um, he he was a lawyer, wasn't he? Well, solicitor. Um, yes, legal, uh, legal professional. Yeah, yes. at the he time was Lord of... Advocate for quite a long time. So yeah. kind of head of justice, sort of. Yes, under suppose... Charles II. Yeah, so I suppose mm-hmm. like an American general attorney, sort of that kind of that kind of role. And he actually uh, was partook in a lot of the witch trials because obviously Scotland, like uh, with with James the. Who became James the Second? Who would have been James the what the sixth or the seventh when he was still Scottish? I can't remember now. Um, was very anti witches, wasn't he? And he he produced mm. the book that Matthew Hopkins is meant to have used as his sort of witchcraft hunting t- how to guide um, idiot's guide to witch hunting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, um, but but Mackenzie did actually. He was in. He partook in a lot of the witch trials, and he actually defended a lot of the witches and stopped them being hanged or burned, as some of them were. Um, and he actually stated on record that he believed there was an awful lot fewer than people thought. It wasn't as prolific as people were being led to believe. And the only reason a lot of them actually confessed is because of the severe torture they were under. It was the only way that they could stop it, and mm. that. It, 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 he, so f- for someone of, in the sort of mid 1600s that's quite um, a, a dangerous thing to say because a lot of people would say well if you don't think they are witches you must be one yourself and you're trying to get them off 
But also that kind of questioning that, well, of course people are confessing, they're being tortured. What would you do? That's quite a modern sort of outlook. And, and, and the reason I sort of say that I think he was misunderstood is if he was as bloodthirsty as people said he was, and we'll go on to why he was believed to be bloodthirsty in a minute, wouldn't he just have liked seeing people getting executed for the sake of it? Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah, that's something that I thought when I was reading up on him. That, but the other thing is that maybe he just it was whoever was paying his bills. He was on their side. I don't know. He could have been that sort of shallow. But um, the reason he is he's known as Bloody Mackenzie or Bloody Mackenzie is because of the um, I can never say it Covenanters, who are basically yeah. Scottish Presbyterian, who who he was. Um, he was tasked with prosecuting a load of them and this is all following on and this is kind of like a long time of history condensed into about 30 seconds but under Charles II there was there was a battle at somewhere called Both- Bothwell Bothwell Brig Bothwell oh my teeth Blech. Bothwell <laughs> Bridge um where the Presbyterians had assembled and were beaten and this was back in on the 22nd of June 1679 and supposedly (coughs) excuse me there was about 1200 of them were arrested and they were brought in and they were brought back to where at Greyfriars there was a prison building Mm. Um, and after some were starved and tortured and executed there was around 257 remaining come the November of 1679 and they were going to be sent to the American colonies apparently the ship sank just off the Orkney Islands and only 48 of them survived so out of 1200 covenanters only 48 in theory survived which is pretty horrific mm-hmm. pretty horrific it numbers is. now the covenanters and if you go on their website it does actually say this they blame sir Mackenzie for the mm. deaths they said that he's the one who should have blood on his hands because he was the one who said he'd pursue them um and get them that you know they were going against the king eh, charles ii <sighs> I'm not sure what I think about that. Well, I, I think George, you know, he was Lord Advocate. So mm. the first thing is, you know, he's paid to do a job, so he'll do a job. Mm. And, you know, as unpopular as that job may have been with the Covenanters, because of course it would be, you know, there, yeah. there'd be certainly none of them would be supporting him, would they? You know, he's completely no. opposed to them. He was actually hunting them down and imprisoning them. Um, but my kind of. And, and I can understand the the point about you know he he's seen as this figure you know this, this bloody Mackenzie but of course they would see him that way wouldn't they you know because mm. he he's the person who in their eyes and yet yeah, to a large extent is responsible for a lot of deaths um, the the prison I do wonder sometimes about actually how regularly he'd have even been at the prison himself mm. as Lord Advocate obviously there would have been guards who were actually tasked with um, imprisoning them and yep. you know not I won't say looking after them but you know being there working supervising there. yeah yes yeah. um and of course it would have been them who dished, dished out any punishment yeah. uh, I mean apparently you know there were severe beatings torture and the the heads uh, you know eventually when they when they did die their heads were apparently placed on the spikes of the gates of the prison to, you know as a kind of very gruesome warning but it it goes back it's the same throughout history you know exactly. it ultimately comes down to religion and yeah. unfortunately you know what they were dealing with with Charles II naming himself or wanted to name himself as the head supreme head of the church you know it's no different to what Henry VIII did really nope. um, and and so when you get a group of people who passionately believe that actually Christ is the head of the church and then you get a group of people who are devout to the king you know that they, they will follow him to the ends of the earth then you get these clashes and you ultimately get murder and yeah. death yeah. so the it's whether George new. Mackenzie it's no I mean <laughs> he, he's you know George Mackenzie he had a job to do um, 
none of us will really know what kind of man he was um, we can only look at things like you say you know with him speaking out during the witch trials you know he wasn't all bad <laughs> but on the other hand you know we we don't know what kind of if, if he felt comfortable enough to speak out on behalf of, of some of these these women during the witch trials then possibly some people may have felt he could have spoken out uh, in defense of some of the covenanters but, but they were breaking the law the covenanters they, mm. they were breaking the laws whereas the witches weren't in the same respect you know mm. it, it, it is a, it's it, to me it is quite a it's a black and white thing you weren't supposed to be non not follow the religion of the monarchy if you don't if you openly don't follow the religion of the monarchy and you stand there and shout it, it, either to our modern sensibilities that's wrong and it's persecution back then well this was the law it's the, it's the same as murder murder was murder there was no mitigating circumstances murder was murder and 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 i i kind of I mean, I was reading up on the because you can actually the covenanters still exist and they still like memorials and the presbyterian church have a lot of information and they basically equate mackenzie to hitler saying this was this was a 1600s version of a concentration camp to wipe out an entire religion and I can kind of see the point they're making, but I, I, I think it's a tenuous link. Uh, it's mm. more of an emotional thing to, to, to create a kind of a reaction from people. Uh, I think that's more why they're saying it. Um, and I can see why they think they were persecuted, but it's, it's the same as maybe in, I don't know, 50 years' time, you won't be prosecuted for stealing. You might be able to say, well, actually, I stole because I needed food. Whereas, and, and if you just look at the whole part of the criminal system back then, it was a lot more, there was a lot less open to interpretation. It was literally, mm. you know, you stole, you're bad, you get hanged. Or, you, know, you, you murder, you're bad, you get hanged. Well, I didn't actually murder them. I shoved them, they fell, they hit their head. It, well, it doesn't matter, you killed them. It was the dead. You know, yeah. it's, it's that kind of, and and as you say, I mean, he he wouldn't have been the one meeting meeting out the, the the punishments in the cells. That would have been the prison guards. And let's be honest, you read anything about prisons from, well, even till the late eighteen hundreds, being abused by the prison officers wasn't uncommon. In fact, it was very very common. And if those prison officers were part of the monic, you know, were monarchists, royalists, to them these people would have been scum because they were deliberately going against the king so i'm not not condoning it because i'm kind of live and let live kind of person but i i just think that that maybe the start the, the short amount of I'd, I'd like to know someone who's done a lot of in-depth work into Mackenzie to see what they would think because i i just sometimes wonder if he's been painted as being a monster but he wasn't he was a product of the time yeah well you know the um the modern day of course Mackenzie Poltergeist doesn't really help with the idea of him being a monster because no. again today we believe or it's told we're told that a lot of the activity that goes on there is thanks to him still <laughs> you know um his his mausoleum where he's buried is there it's said to be highly active and so I mean I've been in the prison on one of the tours um into some of the tombs apparently the the most haunted tomb where people get scratched and bruised and all sorts and you know you get shown a book before you go in full of photographs of people you know people's injuries who've gone in there and came out and this book is well, when I went, um, how long ago was this? Maybe 12 years ago. Right. Um, and it's about 100 pages. You know, it's, it's, it's massive. So now I, I just can't only imagine how big this is. And it's statements. And it and these are really violent scars, um, which people put down to this violent Mackenzie poltergeist, as they call him. You know, so, uh, yeah, it it's, certainly doesn't paint him in a very good light either way, you know, when he was alive or since he's been dead but I have a theory on that too <laughs> go on go on yeah my theory on people who say they get scratched they get bruised and everything by these nasty ghosts who want to hurt them mm -hmm. but, you know I'm, I'm talking kind of tongue in cheek here nasty ghosts but you know what I mean how do we not know that for 200 years that spirit has been standing there literally going hello I'm here I want to talk to you hello hello and nobody's noticed him it's like me sort of going Jane Jane, 
hi, and you're still not listening in the end, I go, hi, down the phone. You'll go, what? How do we not know? And suddenly it's worked out. Actually, I get attention if I scratch. Yes, yeah. people also know I'm here. How do we not know that he's not scratching people to say, I didn't do it. I'm not what you think I am. Please, someone pay attention to me. I am not what you think I am. We seem to assume it's because he enjoys hurting people. But what happens if it's the exact opposite? I mean, we well, I... we all know little kids, if they can't be heard, they'll come and they'll, they'll go, Mum, Mum, Mum. And if you ignore them, then they'll come on and either throw something at you or pull on your skirt. Or it, Could it not be a similar principle? It could be. But then if he can build enough energy to physically do that to someone... Maybe he could just, I don't know, lift the hat off the head and hover it above them or, True. you know, take something, you know, do something else physical that it doesn't actually leave them with, with kind of scary, violent marks. I don't know. I or, you know, it, it may not even be him. I mean, it probably isn't. You know, it could be something else. We don't know about the land that the prison was built on. Um, yeah. We know, of course, that it's within Greyfriars Churchyard where there are lots of stolen bodies and there may well be i mean the the thing with graveyards is of course most of them aren't aren't haunted because why would they be you know um unless something particularly nasty has happened there or unless they're the bodies of murder victims maybe so you know you've got souls at unrest um well at greyfriars you certainly would have lots of souls at unrest you know people whose bodies were taken by Burke and Hare or people who died before their time, people who died through crime, violence, disease Um, you know, these aren't all people who drifted off peacefully in their sleep at old age, you know so um, I think the whole site energy anyway has got an unusual energy Mm. Um, and how that manifests, I don't know, maybe that manifests in the the things that happen to people when they go in the prison there but yeah I, I can kind of see why it's put down to George McKenzie just because he he's the the biggie isn't he he's the it's name notorious. so yeah associated to it um but it, it's certainly one of the most unusual places I've ever been just in terms of not only architecturally and you know just just everything about the setup of it you know you have this church with mm. a graveyard with houses actually sort of built in buildings built into the side so that you know as i was saying before you can look out of a window in a flat or in a house and you're actually at eye level with the tombstones mm. and, and then you have a prison as well um to the back of the church and, and it, it's just all very peculiar yeah. but there is also a feeling that you can't escape when you're in that place and anyone who's spent any time wandering around Greyfriars I'm sure will know what I mean by that you do kind of I know it's the old psychological debate but you do feel watched um and and normally you know for me churchyards are actually very peaceful I'm one of these I'm yeah I'm one of these weird people who do you know I quite like them um I mean my husband grew up in a house which overlooked um, a graveyard his bedroom overlooked oh, and he, he loved it you know <laughs> and his parents used to say it's great it's never going to get built on is it you know we've, we've got this open space and it, it's quite lovely big old trees you can hear the birds singing you know lovely but um greyfriars is is certainly quite unique in my mind um oh. for, for many reasons awesome. but i also love go on uh, no, sorry go on yeah I was going to say, I also love, of course, there's a lovely story connected to Greyfriars, which is that of Bobby, the dog. I was hoping you were going to mention that. Oh. <laughs> I, uh, I mean, the statue out, outside Greyfriars Churchyard, there's, um, well, there's a bar called Bobby's Bar. But then opposite there, there is this lovely statue. I think it used to be maybe a water fountain or something. I'm not really sure. But on the top is this lovely terrier. Um, and the story is that Bobby... Um, he was so loyal to his owner, to his master, that when his owner died, he literally kept vigil at his graveside in Greyfriars for 14 years until the dog went as well and the dog's been buried with him. And I just think it's so lovely. And all around Edinburgh, you know, you see these tourist souvenirs of these little bobby dogs and badges and things. But when you go in there and you see the little little headstone and, and you hear the story you just it's it's really heartwarming in a place that's quite you know notorious for being Dark. pretty terrifying mm. yeah at the 
there's just a lovely story as well and people do believe that they see the ghost of the dog roaming around and hear him howling in a full moon and, and all the rest of it but you know whatever the truth is about that um i think you know it goes a long way to kind of saying well look you get the dark you get the scary you get the bad but of course as with anything you get the light as well yes. and the good and and bobby's certainly one of those he's not injuring anyone or bruising anyone that we know of what a lovely way to end our conversation jane that's a lovely way to oh, end good. it have you got anything going on at the moment that you want to promote on air <sighs> let me think well of course series two of help my house is haunted yeah. that's going to be on in november and mm-hmm. um, we don't know the exact date yet but anyone who's interested in watching that just follow the really pages and that will be up on there or follow myself or barry or chris and we'll obviously share it as soon as we know um i've got a few events coming up um karen's event oh yes i'm at karen's supernatural fair oh, i'm glad you prompted me for that i always forget <laughs> <laughs> yes next saturday 28th in worcester at the cricket club um i'm really looking forward to that you know it's going to be stalls and speakers i'm doing a talk and a paranormal discussion um so i've got the lovely paul stevenson from haunted magazine neil yeah. packer and karen and we'll just be debating i'll be throwing some questions at them some you know tongue-in-cheek and some a little bit more serious just about all things paranormal really so people can come along it's a free day so free entry free talk free parking um so yes if anyone wants to come along to that i would recommend it because karen's great you know great at organizing things like mm. this she um she just throws herself into it 110 percent. and uh, I, I i went to her first fair in evesham and that was great um really busy loads more people than i think even she expected so hopefully this will be a busy one as well cool and then i've got a few things going on um november's fairly quiet but in december january february so yes i like to keep myself out of trouble i've always got to have several things going on at once or we were talking about that weren't we We like having mega loads of plates spinning yes and anyone who wants to check what you're up to just goes over to your jade harris facebook page and everything's posted on there or hd paranormal is that the other one yeah they can either go to my website it's jane dash harris.com or facebook page yeah or any events they're always on the hd paranormal page so yes you can't escape me i'm here there and everywhere popping up all over social media so just yeah anyone who's interested just give me a follow awesome well that's been the lovely jane harris sorry we've just we've gone over the hour a bit but i thought you'd want to hear the full conversation because it's i hope you found it an interesting one to listen to i know i've certainly found it an interesting one to be to be part of i just hope jane doesn't think i was arguing too much when i was saying i have a theory on something but it's um i I have theories on a lot of things anyway next week i'm going to be talking to corinne Bassant all about warmly clock tower down near bristol it's one i don't know much about at all so that's going to be an interesting one to to research don't forget that we do have shows on every night of the week in fact two shows on a tuesday you can catch all of them on spreaker or youtube make sure you you know click like share and subscribe and all that malarkey that our evil queen kerry greenway tells you to do at the beginning of every week tomorrow night is the psh radio show i'm sure you'll enjoy that one and friday is the dark mirror show but on that note my lovelies thank you ever so much for listening i do appreciate it i hope to see you again next week And, uh, well, have a good evening. Sleep tight. Don't worry too much about things that go bump in the night. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to join us for more shows throughout the week. Find us on Facebook, Twitter and the World Wide Web to keep up to date with all the shows right here on Parasearch Radio.